two questions. Just trying to understand the, um, I suppose, a, a question that has gained some currency in the media as well. Uh, Mum or dad tells the 12 year old child they uh, uh, can't go on puberty blockers. Uh, what would be the current, what is that, could you just explain to us the current position in relation to uh, me me medical uh, people such as yourself? Uh, and, and how you would deal with parental involvement. Um, so in our service, um, uh, we make sure that any referral to our paediatric endocrine service, which is looking at, for instance, blockers, um, the, the child should also be seen by a psychologist uh, in the mental health services um, ideally, in the future, we would want that person to be part of our multidisciplinary team. At the moment, in our own service, and it, you know, it's better set up in Auckland. Uh, in our own service, we have um, this thing where we send people to the CAMS, which is the Child and Adolescent Mental Health Service, which is for moderate to severe mental health disorders. Really, that's not the right service to be seeing somebody who isn't mentally disordered who has a transgender issue. So. Uh, but that's a, 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 a feature of funding and, and resources. But um, so we make sure that everybody has uh, has a mental health screening assessment. We ensure that they are fully understanding. And I mean, I think 12 would be uh, very young, but, but it, it can happen. Certainly when puberty changes are starting, what we call Tanner stage two puberty, that's the time to consider blockers. Now blockers... Um, delay things. They're, they're not gender affirming hormones in the sense that they don't affirm the, um, the, the if you like, opposite gender, um, but they do give time to allow the young person to uh, consider what they want. And then when they're older, 16, 17, 18, that's a time that the young person can then decide to go on to gender affirming hormones. But that takes a much higher level of informed consent, if you like, because there are long-term consequences to those treatments, such as infertility. And so but the, the blockers is a way that we can uh, allow the young person to express their gender in a safe way uh, without making kind of permanent uh, decisions. But if, if a full court bench of the High Court of England and Wales, I'm sorry, I haven't got the exact phraseology in front of me, but it was dealing with young persons, actually a bit older than young persons, uh, effectively, and I appreciate there'd be many people, and this is not the case, regretting the transition. And they, they described it was something along the lines of the puberty blockers as innovative and experimental. And in some instances, they, they put in place an effective ban on their use uh, prior to the age of 18. But am I right? We have quite a different position here amongst uh, our health system, and we've taken a very different approach to that. That's correct, and, and in fact, that that decision was kind of appealed, and and uh, on a human rights um, perspective, I think that the um, but that's pending. Yeah, it, it was the law of right. the land in England at the moment. That that's right, and and I think that. You know, ultimately in medicine, our goal is to do no harm or to try and assess what is the path that will, will not produce harm. But we know that preventing a young person from uh, having blocking hormones, allowing their secondary sexual uh, development to occur uh, can be extremely distressing. Uh, and that that distress can lead to suicide. Can, I, I showed you the, the data of one in five attempting suicide. So, you know, so it's a matter of the balance of harms. And I personally and, and, and most practitioners, I think, around the world would say that, the, that it's an, a very conservative view um, of the court. And that's being challenged on the basis that actually in terms of the balance of harm, uh, that that's more harmful than actually uh, in, a, in a proper multidisciplinary team uh, with appropriate safeguards providing hormonal treatments as, as appropriate. But what decision rights do parents have at the moment on these issues in that 12-year-old case? Um, or 14-year-old so, for that matter, or 15-year-old? Sure. 
So the goal is always to get the parents and uh, alongside and supporting the, the young person uh, and, and to do things together. But there are situations and they're upheld in law where a young person who is 14 or 15, there's a concept of Gillick competence. Uh, and that concept is that if a young person has the ability to understand consequences, uh, is, is able to give their own consent that, and uh, that they are able to do that. Now, in a gender-affirming clinic, they would be really reticent, I think, to do that. Their goal would always be to try and get the parents alongside. Um, and so that would be quite a rare situation where Gillick competence would, would uh, come into play. And generally, uh, it, it's, it's possible that you can get... Uh, you know, you can get an understanding and a, and a general agreement from from both the, the young person and their parents or parents.